up in the next building with their radio. Do they call and say, Liddy, get out of there? <laughs> no. That, friends, was a Doonesbury setup. That was a comic setup. And so why? Because what happened with Richard Nixon? Now, as soon as Agnew went, who did Nixon appoint vice president? Rockefeller. Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller. But there was an old harder than woodpecker lips guy by the name in Arizona of Goldwater, and he said, nothing doing. We're not having that trilateralist council on relations son of a bitch in as vice president. And by golly, he got his way. Who did they bring in, though? Gerald Ford. Who's Gerald Ford? Second lieutenant to the Rockefellers. Now Nixon goes. We have to pass an amendment to the Constitution because never before in American history have we ever had a president and a vice president that were unelected. These guys were appointed. And who did Ford appoint? Nelson. And they had defanged our good senator from Arizona at that time. Now just follow this a little bit. Who then starts shooting at Gerald Ford? Squeaky from. She didn't hit him. But if she would have, we would have had old Nelson at the wheel, at the helm, and we would have been steered right over the brink to the New World Order long ago. Follow this. Who was Reagan's biggest critic back when they were beginning the campaign in 80? George Bush. Reagan had said he never would accept Bush as his running mate. Then he went to New York, and he met with Rockefeller. He was told in that meeting, the reason I say this is because a man who has first knowledge of that meeting, the name of Cleon Skousen, told me this. He said he was told the only way he would see the inside of the White House was as a tourist if he didn't take George Bush as his running mate. Now, Kitty Callie has put out dirt on the missus, but some of that dirt even, if some of it is true, you can understand why a movie star, I voted for him twice because I thought he could see the cavalry coming over the hill in the last moments. Seriously, didn't you? Come on, you guys did it too. All right, now Reagan takes on, because he doesn't want the dirty laundry, he wants to win by a landslide. He's a vain man. Takes on George Bush thinking, hey, who's the vice president? Can you name six vice presidents? Who's the vice president anyways? Nobody. He was inaugurated January 20th, 1981. What happened March 31st, 1983? Two things. One is Bo Greit sent a top secret special intelligence message to Ronald Reagan at the White House. And wasn't I surprised to watch television and see that Mr. Hinckley had shot up James Brady, the Secret Service man, and the policeman. Do you think Hinckley shot Ronald Reagan? No more so than Lee Harvey Oswald pulled the trigger on JFK. All this is in detail in this new book by Detail Fact. But I just want you to see how this thing happens. Here we are in front of the hotel in Washington, D.C. Hinckley is firing away. Look at the videotape. Hinckley is using a 38 special. That blows you away. That's what it did. A 22 does doesn't do that to you, folks. Again, I'm an expert at this. I've run these programs. What happens? George Bush is in where? Where is George Bush? Dallas, Texas. Isn't that just a little bit coincidental? George Bush is in Air Force One at Dallas, Texas. Ronald Reagan is pushed into the car, remember? And he is whisked off. Brady's laying there. The meat wagon comes, and five minutes later, Brady is put aboard and taken to the hospital, George Washington University. Who arrived first? Brady arrived first. How long after Brady arrived did George, or did uh, Ronald Reagan arrive? 15 minutes after Brady arrived, Ronald Reagan arrives. The Secret Service says, quote, we got lost. <laughs> that is bush lip. I was going to say it's a lie, but it's better to say it's bush lip because it is politically oriented. That's bush lip. Secret Service does not get lost, not in Washington, D.C., not anywhere. They're not supposed to, unless that's part of the game plan. Ronald Reagan says, quote, this is his own words. I didn't think I was hurt 
until I was inside the car and the Secret Service man was on top of me. Then I felt a sharp pain in my side, like a hammer hitting me. I thought the Secret Service man's pistol had injured me. That's the words of Ronald Reagan. Now, when they got him to the hospital, he had some flecks of blood around his mouth. These were all the newspaper. Just go to the library and pull this stuff up. The, they couldn't find a bullet. They x-rayed him three times and no bullet. Finally, a nurse saw a very tiny entrance wound right at the seventh rib. And then by probing, they were able to find a flechette. Friends of flechette, we have bullets that make no noise. These are major caliber bullets. These are 30 and 45 caliber bullets that are silent. But that makes a very large hole and a signature. A flechette is projected by a gas-powered gun. And it is, as the doctor said, what I found was a flechette that was thinner than a dime. It was one quarter inch from his aorta. George Bush was that close to being president by ascension, and our president, Ronald Reagan, was that close to death. Now, I think that that's very real for a movie star. And I think that what happened was is when he didn't die, they began to say, uh-oh, what do we do now? I think they were headed for Bethesda Naval Hospital. That's where they worked over Kennedy. And I think when he didn't die, they said, uh-oh. And then somebody said, take him back, take him back. 20 minutes he's out there driving around while Brady, 15 minutes, Brady's at the hospital. So George Bush, I don't think, has just been in term once. I think he's had three terms because I believe when Ronald Reagan said, I didn't know, I think he was telling the truth. I think that as of that moment, Ronald Reagan became a man who read the lines in the White House and George Bush was the man who was pushing because the whole purpose is a new canal in Nicaragua. That's the whole thing behind the Iran-Contra. George Bush knows. He knows about drugs in, in Nicaragua. George Bush knows about drugs coming out of Burma. George Bush knows about the American hostages that were left in the hands of the Ayatollah at Khomeini so that Carter would lose the election. George Bush knows about the eight Americans that died at Desert One as sacrifice during that aborted raid. George Bush knows about a lot of things. If he was head of the CIA, if he was vice president, and actually I think the controller in the White House for three terms, if he's president and he doesn't know he's inept, he and the rest of them I think need to be fired. Very quickly, Things that I think you can do, number one is demand the prisoners of war returned. Gorbachev has the answers. That's something that everybody should be able to get on board with. Number two is we've got to federalize the Fed. You'll hear more about that, so I won't say so much on it. The Fed is the eight people, eight entities I named you. They are breaking our back. Debtors are not choosers. What do you mean by federalizing? Well, I mean legalize it. Now, Kennedy, for example, he just said we're printing U.S. notes, basically to hell with the Fed. But if Congress, because the Constitution says that Congress has a responsibility, but if they are so inept that they can't handle it, then let's pay the Federal Reserve green checks and put them under the federal system so we're not paying them debt money. It's dumb to pay debt money, 8% interest on every dollar that is manufactured. Why? To a civilian private banking corporation. Well, the, obvi the why is obvious, because they're going to break us like Rothschild had always figured on doing. Number three is watch out for this ID system. This ID system is a credit debit thing that is coming. I just read you the beginning. All of the things they're trying to do to come in the back door. They're already doing it overseas. Be careful, because once they get control through the credit debit system, you're going to be marked, and I think that you're going to be, at that point, over the brink. You're going to be lost. Don't allow any national emergency to be declared in the United States. Last year, they almost declared a national emergency, a drug emergency. Any time a national emergency is declared, it means you can suspend the Constitution in favor of martial law. 
we lose the Constitution, we lose our First Amendment rights, we wouldn't be standing here. All these bases they're closing up, you're going to be herded in there if you are a protester. National emergencies are in effect now that have never been rescinded? Well, there are national emergencies that are standing there waiting, but George Bush and others don't feel at this time they could get away with it because we are not disarmed. And that is very frankly the truth. There are things that we can do. Remember that there is no letter T on the end of the word American. I want to tell you a little joke that I heard that is very appropriate. You can pass around to your friends. It lets them know what's happening today. A little kid needed money. And so he decided he would uh, write a letter to God. So he wrote a letter and he said, Dear God, I need $100. Thank you, Johnny. Well, the post office, and he just addressed it to God, USA. God must live in USA. And so the postal department got it and said, isn't this cute? A letter to God, USA. They opened it. They said, oh, their heart was touched. They sent it to the president. Who else? And uh, George Bush got the letter and he opened it. He says, oh, this is so touching. He showed it to his wife and he says, you know, I'm going to send this kid $5. So he put $5 in the letter and he sent it to little Johnny. Johnny got the letter, he opened it up, he saw it was from Washington, D.C., it was only five bucks, and so he sat down and wrote God a thank you note. He says, God, thank you. I don't know why, but you chose to send the money through Washington, D.C., and the bastards took 95%. <laughs> A final word to you before I step off and, and Cy gets up here. I, my whole life, and I wouldn't trade a minute of it. I really, I pray a lot. I'm not afraid of anything on this earth. My religion is that good. But I pray a lot because I'm thankful. I'm thankful to be a pilot. I'm thankful to have the, the, the view that I have of this world. I'm thankful for the opportunities that I have. I'm thankful for being alive through the many times that I've been out there on the pushing the envelope on the periphery. And, you know, a lot of times my guys have come to me when we've really been in a tight. And they have said, sir, uh, we're surrounded. When we were in Laos in 1983, we got a message from the CIA that said, you are surrounded, return immediately. It's midnight. We're on top of a mountain. You don't go nowhere in the jungle at midnight on top of a mountain in the middle of Laos, especially if you're surrounded. <laughs> Well, the next message was, if you don't, because I just said, forget it, we're pressing on. And they said, if you don't return immediately, all support is off. Boy, that's kind of fickle, isn't it? Well, we didn't care because we didn't need a CIA at that point. We were moving toward the target. A lot of times my guys have come to me and said, sir, how are we going to make it? I don't know how I knew that we were going to make it, but I did know. There was just something that said to me in a voice that I understood that says, hey, there's a door, and you're going to make it. I want to give you the hope that I have and where I got it from. I was a young cadet in military academy in the South, and we had a guy named Major Kelly. Kelly taught me how to pray. Kelly would ask a question, and he gave us in one semester Old Testament, the other semester New Testament. Here would be Kelly's method. He'd open the Old Testament, and he would say, what is the situation in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 11 through 17? And then he would look over the core, and we would be praying because Kelly either gave you a zero or a hundred, depending on your answer. And boy, that sure did take down your average quick. <laughs> we learned to pray. I thought Kelly was trying to teach us the Bible. He wasn't. He was teaching us how to pray. I got close to the Lord by saying, please don't let Major Kelly call on me. <laughs> but do you know what is in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 to 17? There was only two verses. It's a verse I've never forgotten because I've been there so many times. You've got a guy by the name of Elisha. And uh, he is a spy for Israel. And the king of Assyria is trying to encapsulate Israel and defeat them. And the king is angry, and his staff is saying, it's Elisha. You don't use the water closet that he doesn't know and tell. And the king says, well, wipe him out. 
And so in verse 15, you have the army of Assyria around Elisha. And it's dawn. And Elisha's handyman is up, his aide. And he's scratching under his robe. And he looks out. And here's all the armies like Custer and, and the Indians. Here's all of the Assyrians in the world. And so he goes back and says, <clears throat> excuse me, master. What shall we do? For we are surrounded by the armies of Assyria. And Elisha, without, you can just see him in the words of the Old Testament, without hardly yawning, Elisha says, don't worry about it. There's more for us than there is against us. And you, I've seen it in the faces of my own soldiers. The guy is saying, uh-huh, there's me and there's you and there's all them guys out there. What do you mean more for us than there is against us? Elisha understands and any Elisha says, this is what verse 15 says. He says, Lord, Open this young man's eyes that he may see. And the Lord does. And what does Elisha's young man see? He sees between the armies of Assyria and them are angels in chariots of fire. And not one hair of their head is harmed. Now you are an American. You're here, what I believe is the land of milk and honey. It is the new Zion. It is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. We are special, every one of us. We didn't win a raffle in order to become an American citizen. You're here because you're meaningful. Who are we to ever fear anything from the new world order? If we are striving righteously and we want to do what is right, who is it for us to say that the odds are against us? Open your eyes that you may see for I believe that there are angels, even with chariots of fire, that will stand between us and the new world order. And I believe it enough that I'm willing to stand. I certainly am not going to run. Uh, there's no greater country. I may go down, but if I do, I'll go down swinging. And I invite you to either lead or to follow, but for God's sakes, don't get out of the way. Thank you. power of the people is the jury. What about the Fija? The, this is the fully informed jury amendment. We don't need an amendment to, to give the jury knowledge of its responsibilities and rights. Unfortunately, the judges, that's why they call it Washington, D.C. You ever thought about that? District of Criminals. That's what <laughs> D.C. stands for, I believe. The federal judge, in my own case, I told my lawyer, I said, I don't need anything. I'll stand up and tell the jury this story, and they will find me not guilty. And he said, oh, boy, Bo, you cannot instruct the jury. He said, the judge instructs the jury. The prosecutor instructs the jury. They will instruct them to the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. And I said, but that's not the way the Constitution is written. That's not the way the He says, it doesn't make any difference. That's the way it is. The fully informed jury amendment, I support 100%. It would require the justices to explain to the jury that it's just not their job to consider the facts of the case. It's their job to weigh whether or not this law has any applicability to this person, whether or not there's any spirit of the law there, because that's the real intent. All right, now, because I've got to get through four of these, and I'll do it quick. Do you have any information about the, uh, the total property tax uh, in Oklahoma? Yeah, I've talked to the guys in Oklahoma. Here's what it is, for those of you who may not know. In 1990, they were going to pass a law that would be effective January of 91 in Oklahoma where you had to go down to the bank and you picked up a form and you had to list every asset, whether it's a pocket watch, whether it's a rifle, an old tractor, a uh, record set, uh, a 49ers uh, blanket. You had to put it down. And if they didn't believe you, they could come out and search. And anything they found that you hadn't listed as assets, then they could charge you a 100% penalty on. Well, that law was in the House, in the consideration, but that law did not go into effect in January of 1991. It's like the emergency that didn't go into effect in 1991. It's like the ID card that didn't go into effect. It's there, though. It is a looming, shadowy peril that we must guard against. 
Arizona, I just told you, they've got this new scannable, you gotta have it now so you can register your car. Isn't that just one more step to having your own ID? One more step to putting the bar right on yourself so you go up and they scan you to charge your groceries to your bank account? Sure it is. And so this thing in Oklahoma is very scary because if it does pass, look out. You're next, probably literally, because most of you are CIO, aren't you? California improved Okies. <laughs> How do we know that uh, you're uh, just not another disinformation? Head out of rectal defilade, look at the videotapes. Uh, what I have tried to do in my experience is because it is secret work and we're always told, don't ever talk about it, don't ever do anything about it. But everything I say, friends, is in photo, document, it's in videotape. Barbara Honiger is back there with the October surprise in her video. Strecker's back there. We're going to have more AIDS talk today. All of these people who are consummate experts, if I don't know about it as an intelligence officer, I go and I accept the information. But then what I do is I confirm every shred. If you think I'm disinformation, then, friend, it's interesting, because I think George Bush uh, thinks of it the other way. Otherwise, he wouldn't have told the U.S. attorney, you get Bo Grice, and all of the other things that have happened. If, if I'm disinformation, I don't want to be. I want to be an American citizen who's loyal, even as I think that I am. Let's see, this one, uh, please explain the powers of the jury that each juror has and most are not told about. Okay, that's kind of in the Fiji, and you know, for, let me just give you an example. The runaway slaves, back during the, before the Civil War, if you were a slave and you ran away, by the letter of the law, when they brought you before the court, you're guilty. But the juries just stopped finding them guilty. Didn't make a damn what the facts of the law were, they just said no. We're not finding the guy guilty. So they had to do away with the law. A guy by the name of William Penn was a Quaker, and it was against the law. You had to be a member of the Church of England, otherwise they cut your throat. William Penn was brought before the court, but the jury wouldn't find him guilty. He was guilty. He admitted he was guilty. He said, I won't change my religion. A guy by the name of Bouchel, was not just a poor man, Bouchel was a, was a international trader, maritime trader, he had a lot of money. He wouldn't find Penn guilty. The judge put Bouchel in prison, denied him all human rights. He didn't have a place for a latrine facility, he had to sleep in his own waste. Can you imagine that happening to you because you wouldn't find a man guilty? Then finally, when he couldn't break Bouchel, the judge had to let William Penn go and we got Pennsylvania out of it. The jury system is powerful. It is more powerful than Supreme Court, more powerful than George Bush, more powerful than Rockefeller or Rothschild. This is our country, if we are willing to keep it that way. Okay, I'll see you later on. Today. By the way, all the stuff I've got, you can certainly have. All you got to do is see George. Thank you, Bo.